Welcome. We're here for an emergency session of Hired the Podcast with all of the wild and woolly stuff that's been happening in the world of work and the economy these past week. Uh, we thought it'd be a great idea to bring resident expert, vice president of analytics and consulting for Miller Resource Group, Alex Shosofsky, in to tell us, well, Alex, what the hell's going on? Yeah, it's, uh, it's hard to make sense of it all with the information coming at us daily, if not hourly. So in the last week, we've had a lot of economic data releases. I'll start with the good news. The labor market continues to be very resilient. Um, when we look at the number of jobs we added in the month of February, 311,000, terrific performance. It's down from the over 500K jobs that we added in January, but still way above the trend pre-pandemic when 200,000 was a good month, uh, all things considered. It does represent slowing growth in the market. Uh, when we look at 2022 and 2021, on average, there was about 400,000 jobs added, so the market has slowed somewhat, but still remains extremely resilient. We still have 10.8 million open positions in the United States, and uh, companies continue to struggle to fill those positions. So from the implications of that to businesses, it's gonna continue to remain challenging to find, attract, hire, and retain the workers that they have, and they really have to be above and beyond, not only their peers in their industry, but across the entire landscape of being better in terms of what you offer to candidates, in terms of the financial and non-financial compensation that you present, and in terms of having the right culture and the right mindset to treat your people well, to listen to them, even the criticism that they have of you, and to make adjustments on the fly, because that's what it's gonna take. Now, shifting gears on the more financial side of things, we obviously had uh, a lot of happenings on the banking front. Um, SVG, which is the bank that tailored primarily to startups, was taken over by the feds when they had a liquidity crisis. Uh, several smaller banks were also taken over. Now, the good news that was not expected is that the Fed said that even beyond the 250K that is typically guaranteed mm -hmm. by the FDIC, they're going to make all of the bank's customer whole. So all of that money will be repaid back to those startups, which is obviously good news for Silicon Valley and many of the tech firms. I think in general, it reflects an environment that is challenging from a financial perspective, both for banks and for businesses. So kind of some of the drivers behind the collapse of those banks in particular is basically interest rate policy. And so they had bought a lot of long-term government debt uh -huh. that would have been perfectly fine if held to maturity. But when people are asking you for their money back for their deposits, you have to a lot of times sell the investments that you have at whatever the market rate is at that particular point in time. So because we have seen a lot of interest rate rise, the value of the bonds that they had bought was below what they paid for them. And so it created this gap in their financial statements and simply not enough money to pay back all of the deposits that they received, which is why they encountered that crisis. Now, there is fear that the contagion will spread. Um, you know, For example, if you look at companies like Charles Schwab, they came under immense pressure. Their stock was down over 30% at the low point just because of these type of developments. Uh, just today and yesterday, Credit Suisse out of Switzerland was under similar pressures for different reasons, but the Swiss government had to step in and say, no, we're, everything is gonna be okay. So it reflects an environment that in my opinion has a lot of anxiety and fear driving decision-making based on the macro landscape and on the very real challenges that the banks face. Is the fear justified? The short answer is it's overblown. Now, there okay. are some signs for concern. Uh, in particular, you know, the, the interest rate changes that we've seen over the last year have made it very difficult for um, kind of guaranteed investments like bonds, which a lot of banks hold. Uh, they are below market value relative to where most of those bonds were purchased, especially if they're longer term duration bonds. But the fear that we are having a financial crisis on par of what we saw in 2008, 2009 with the likes of 
Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns going under. That's, I think, not realistic. Uh, if you look at the rules that regulate the banking environment, uh, the larger banks, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, um, you know, JP Morgan, they're beholden to much more stringent uh, requirements to hold capital mm -hmm. uh, in, in availability to their clients than they were during the financial crisis of the Great Recession. And those rules remain in place. Now, at some point, the smaller banks, like the ones that went under this week, managed to successfully lobby and get the government to remove those rules for their operations. They said, we're not like the big guys. We're beholden to a different set of circumstances. You shouldn't hold us to the same kind of accountability requirements. And because that happened, mm. then they got into some b worse behavior. But overall, it should not be a major concern to people that the banking sector is in some sort of crisis. Short term, does it look like this has any effect on the hiring landscape over the next next couple of months? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think that the hiring landscape, you know, in the financial sector in particular, especially connected to uh, the housing market, mortgages and things of that nature, has already been under stress because of what's been going on again with that uh, that interest rate policy that the Fed continues to tweak in order to cool the inflationary pressure in the economy. But I would say that um, outside of that specific kind of trend within the financials, particularly as related to mortgages and, and housing, uh, no, I don't think there's going to be a significant change in terms of hiring. Manufacturing companies are still struggling to fill 800,000 open positions. The professional and business services sector has over 2.2 million jobs available right now. And while companies are certainly um, thinking about maybe lowering the number of expansion plans that they have, so perhaps you know, curtailing their hiring plans, backfilling is going to be a thing, and they are still going to look to grow to fill the positions that they have open. So I think that it's going to remain very dynamic. I think it's going to be a candidate-driven market in 2023. The pendulum is not going to swing in the favor of the employer. And so, as I mentioned before, you know, you don't have to outrun the bear, but you do have to run away from everybody else running from the bear in order to have a chance of winning the war for talent mm -hmm. this year. Manufacturers, they have so many challenges right now. When we were at lunch, we were talking to um, an industry organization. They were saying that a lot of members in their industry, um, there's a, f a four year lead time on product. They just can't get the supplies they need to fulfill these orders for up to four years, and that's and that's wild. And how do, is there anything companies can do to overcome those challenges and withstand that the shape of the market until it gets back to a more sustainable level, if it ever does? Yeah, unfortunately, when it comes to both order backlog and lead times for new orders, there's really not a short-term fix mm -hmm. uh, necessarily. Uh, at this point, people are basically placing orders based on availability rather than price in many industries. And so that only fuels the fire of that type of problem occurring. Now, I do think that uh, with the macroeconomic environment being on the backside of the cycle and going into a likely mild recession late this year, early in 2024, we are going to see some of that demand side cool. So hopefully both the backlog of existing orders and the lead times to new products are going to shrink over time. But they're not going to go to zero overnight. Mm -hmm. So when you think about your supply chain and having redundancy of particular components, materials, semiconductors, other electronics, it's going to be very, very important for companies to continue to look for additional partners, additional sourcing locations, have a, a strategy that in involves different parts of the world. You know, sourcing things from China this year, especially in the semiconductor field, is extremely challenging. If you look towards Eastern Europe, if you look towards Central and Latin America, uh, that might create a little bit of an avenue for venting some of that pressure. But unfortunately, it's just going to take time to work through that issue. We're still dealing with a lot of the hangovers of the supply chain crisis. Mm -hmm. Now, that is improving. There's a great series from the Federal Reserve Board of New York that is kind of the global supply chain pressure index that clearly showing signs of improvement, but it's still at levels that are substantially elevated from the pre-pandemic normal. Mm -hmm. So it's going to take time. Do you see these supply chain challenges over the last couple of years having an effect on reshoring, which we know has been a topic of conversation for a while now? 
Yes, uh, the United States stands to benefit significantly and has been for several years now benefiting from the reshoring trend. There's a lot of foreign direct investment that's pouring into this country because companies um, that are international in nature, they look to markets where there's greatest opportunity for growth and greatest stability. And the United States matches both of those uh, kind of requirements. So there's a lot of European companies looking to invest in the United States and build local facilities here. A lot of companies from Asia. In fact, Miller Resource Group just helped a Chinese company find a new director of sales for their uh, operation here, uh, which was a really interesting novel thing that we hadn't been mm -hmm. asked to do frequently in the past. And U.S. manufacturers, uh, particularly in the semiconductor field, they're looking to bring capacity back to the United States to deal with some of those issues of supply chain vulnerability that were identified during the COVID pandemic and the immediate aftermath of it. So, yeah, I think it's both. It's amazing. American businesses bringing operations back to the United States to guarantee quality, reliability, and availability of components and materials. It is also foreign companies looking to invest in the United States, and that brings uh, opportunities here as well. Um, but we're already having problems hiring people, so all these companies are coming back to the United States. What's that going to do for companies' ability to hire talent? Yeah, it's going to remain very challenging. As I said earlier, now what we've seen is there are sectors of the economy that are privy to different forces, the tech industry being a great example. Mm -hmm. Everyone's read about all of the layoffs. Facebook's parent company Meta announced another 10,000 headcount reduction just in the last two days. Uh, and I think what it reflects is that opportunity for smaller and medium-sized companies to actually benefit from access to talent that they didn't have during mm -hmm. 2021 and 2022. So the shift is in place to kind of go away from some of the bigger publicly traded companies with tremendous resources. Those are looking to be a little bit more conservative and defensive, and now opening up the landscape for smaller and medium-sized businesses to actually get the talent that they need. What's your opinion on that? So it's been in the news for the last month or two, all of these layoffs. Do you think people at some of these smaller, mid-sized companies, whether it's in the tech sector or not, should they have a fear of layoffs coming at their organization? Well, I think that first and foremost, you need to put it into context, right? The the media, uh, particularly things that we read online, tends to put a certain spin on things. To no, <laughs> they don't. They do. You'll be shocked to hear no. that they do. And really, when you add up all of these layoffs, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Meta, Netflix, all of these tech companies together have laid off about 100,000 people. Now, I mentioned earlier, in the month of February alone, we added 311,000 jobs in the United States. So you can see the relative perspective there is just that the fear and the hysteria doesn't match up when you look at the data you know, mm -hmm. beholden to it. So I think that it's really, really important to realize that that tends to be overblown and that those people that were laid off at the tech companies, there's some really interesting recent data that shows most of them 90 plus percent were able to find a new job within three months of mm -hmm. losing their previous employment. So there are opportunities. Don't buy into the fear and the negative negativity. Continue to challenge yourself to become better at attracting, hiring, and retaining the people that you have, and you should be okay. So the, there's an influx of small-ish, relatively speaking, 100,000 is still a lot of people affected, but an influx of talent. What can companies do now to outrun the other people that are running from the bear? What can they do to set themselves apart in this very short term to take advantage of this influx of available talent? Yeah, so I do a lot of presentations on this topic of how do you become attractive to potential candidates? And there's really two key elements that I talk to that are tactical initiatives that companies really need to think about. Number one, you have to think about talent attractiveness as a sales and marketing function in your organization. Okay. So this traditional notion of, you know, you're in the elevator with a CEO of a company that you want to work for, you have to have a 30 second spiel, a, a pitch, if you will, to convince them that they should hire you to work in their organization. That's been turned on its head. Companies now need to develop a message that they can take to the marketplace, display on their website, in their marketing materials, and most importantly, espoused by their people in word of mouth advertising that highlights the market, why it's exciting to be in their industry, why the products and services that they serve the marketplace with 
position people for success, why the team that they've built is a f uh, is something that's full of winners, that's going to be good for people's careers, and what they do as an organization that goes beyond just making money, you know, beyond the bottom line, philanthropic activities, you know, community engagement, and so on and so forth. If you can do that and make it part of your ethos as an organization to continuously take that message to the audience, uh, which are candidates, prospects that will work for you, it's going to result in a better uh, means of attracting people to your organization. The flip side of that coin is you also have to understand what motivates people. And that's obviously one of the things that we focus on here at Miller Resource Group, which is we have a survey that we ask each prospective candidate to fill out called CLAMPS. CLAMPS is uh, an acronym that stands for Challenge, Location, uh, Advancement, Money, People, and Security. Mm -hmm. And we simply ask folks to rank these parameters in order of one to six, what, what is most important to you. And then we share that with the hiring authority and advise them to tailor the conversation to focus on the things that people really care about. And it's not going to be the same conversation over and over again, but actually particular to that individual sitting across the desk from you. If you're able to do that effectively, you will see a much better efficacy of your interviews and you will have a much higher uptake of candidates that actually want to select you as an employer of choice. When we do that, that clamps exercise, it's interesting. Money is never the top one, but it's also never the bottom one. It is almost always two or three. And I know that's been a challenge for a lot of companies lately, compensation, because of the shortage of talent. Salaries have gone up, especially for skilled positions. But companies are having a tough time paying that and justifying it because of internal equity. They've already got people in similar positions right. making significantly less than people are coming in to ask for. But the price is the price, man. I mean, the market's the market. so. What is the what's the forecast look like for that? What's happening with salaries and compensations and what can companies do when people are commanding significantly higher salaries for positions that were paying significantly less two, three, four, five years ago? Yeah, it, it is absolutely a challenge that companies are struggling with right now. So to put things into context, the current increase in year-over-year -year compensation, uh, as of the latest data point put out by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, is 4.6% growth year-over-year, -year, uh, which means that the days of the 2% COLA, right, the cost of living adjustment, are behind us and are likely not coming back anytime soon with what inflation has been doing. We're currently at 6% on the mm -hmm. CPI. Uh, so how do companies cope with something like that? Well, first and foremost, they have already been making adjustments. So if you look at 2022, the average wage increase for people staying in place at their existing positions was about 8% okay. from some research that I saw. And the average increase for people jumping ship, going to, some, to a competitor or a different industry is around 16%. Now, that is driven in large part by some really kind of ridiculous offers that we've seen, 30, 40, 50 percent over what the person is currently making at their Especially in the sector that just laid 100,000 people Especially off. Especially in that sector, exactly. So uh, what companies need to know is that some of those outliers are going to fall off, and we're not going to see the same kind of dynamic for ridiculousness as we've seen in the past. But they also have to realize that they have to allocate higher budgets to their HR, uh, function to the talent uh, cost associated with their business, because even if inflation does continue to decline, we're not likely to get back to the 2% target uh, that the Fed has for that metric. And so people will feel like the cost of lives is just more expensive than it has been in the past. Therefore, they will ask and, and, and hopefully uh, get higher raises on an annual basis outside of merit increases. These are just kind of the annual compensation adjustments. But companies need to keep that in mind when setting prices, when keeping track of their profitability metrics, whether it's at the product line level or at the customer level. And they have to be prepared for an environment where they continue to raise prices to their customers. And this is going to be very challenging given that we are in this backside of the cycle momentum and that things are slowing and companies are looking to cut costs. And, but everyone's trying to fight inflation simultaneously. They are. How does that all work together? Well, that's a, that's a tricky proposition. I think that the way you go about it is first and foremost, you have to remove guesswork, emotion, and kind of the mentality of we've always done things from the equation. You have to be driven by data, and we at Miller Resource Group help companies do that all the time by partnering with a company called Labor IQ to deliver insightful, 
accurate compensation analyses and benchmarking tools that they can say, all right, for this particular position, what is the competitive market rate today? What are people making on median or on average, if you want to look at it from that perspective, that are currently employed in those positions? What does it take us to attract talent you know, into those openings that we have? And how do we manage the conversation between those two uh, benchmarks, right? So it requires knowing what to offer, potential candidates coming in, and also doing a benchmarking assessment of the people that you currently have working for you to identify the red flags, those that are making substantially below current market rates, and engaging those individuals in a conversation. Like, how different does it feel if you're a candidate and, or an employee and your boss comes to you and says, we've done some research, we realize that you're making below the market rate right now, we want to take steps to address that shortfall, right? Let's figure out what we can do. Let's put a, a long-term plan in place where we can get you up to that rate. I can't do it overnight. I can't do it in one fell swoop. But let's also talk about the things that you value that go beyond the base salary, right? Is it potentially some additional PTO or some flexible work arrangements or some long-term incentive that we can offer you? And maybe it's philanthropic activities or any other things that are one of the levers that a company can pull on your behalf. So let's have that proactive conversation and the result is from a employee perspective it's a whole new ball game right because the company is treating you as a partner it's no longer this old school mentality of I'm the employer you're the employee and I'm gonna tell you what's gonna happen let's have a discussion where I tell you as a company what I need from you to be successful to help me reach my goals and you as an individual as an employee can tell me what you need from me in order for you to reach your own goals. That kind of relationship is so much stickier and so much resilient in the face of change than just this traditional power down dynamic that I alluded to earlier. That's the shift, right? The mindset at the company level has to be, we have to be more flexible than we've ever been before. We have to be open to hearing our employees honest feedback, even if it's critical, we have to be willing and open to listen to that, and then actually commit resources, energy, effort, time, and money to fixing the shortcomings that we have, right? It can't just be like the suggestion box with a basketball hoop over a trash can, right? Mm -hmm. It needs to show that we are not only listening, but we're actually taking steps to right some of the things that you're telling us are wrong within the business. Mm -hmm. Well, Alex, uh, so the next time people see us talk, these positions might be reversed. I heard that you are starting a new podcast yourself sometime soon. Tell me a little bit about that. Yes, I am. I'm very excited. The podcast is called 3DM, the podcast, and the 3DM stands for Data Driven Decision Making. And so the whole goal of the podcast is basically to provide business leaders and decision makers with tools that they can leverage to use information, business intelligence, their own company data, and people analytics to have a better performance in the business. So I'm going to be the host. I'm going to be inviting guests with expertise expertise in each one of those three areas, whether it's specific company performance metrics or market intelligence or people analytics. And we're going to be talking about tactical and practical things that companies can do, look at data in a specific way, analyze the interpretation of it, and then put things in place that will take advantage of the insights that they glean from the data. So it's very uh, action oriented and designed to provide the business community, particularly the smaller companies that mm -hmm. really have no analytics capability right now, of some ideas of what they can do to get better at running their business. Mm -hmm. Well, it's going to be great. Uh, people have any questions or want to reach out to you in any way, what's the best way to find you? Yeah, of course, you can find me on LinkedIn. Always uh, look me up by my name. You can also find me here at the Miller Resource Group. My email is alexc at millerresource.com, and I'd love to hear from you. Let's talk about your challenges, your opportunities, and how you can run a better business. Where's your world taking you? World tour taking you next? you got a couple of speaking engagements coming yeah, up. Yeah, I've got everything from California and Dallas to Florida and the East Coast. So you never know, know what where you're going to find me on any given day of the week, but I'm excited. I'm looking forward to the rest of the 20, 2023 calendar year, and I hope I get a chance to talk to you in the audience soon. Well, thanks, Alex. Really appreciate it. Big thank you to Noah Cuff, our producer. This has been an emergency episode of Hired the Podcast. Thanks so much. Talk to you soon. Take care.